Jesus hung around with prostitutes. We seem a little taken back. What about a ministry to prostitutes today? in a world in which there's an awful lot of hopelessness. There are many people who find themselves without a direction, without an anchor, without a sense of real purpose in their life, and they're looking for that. And sometimes they're slaves. They're slaves of an addiction to drugs, to sensuality, and looking for hope. Today we're going to be talking with a Assembly of God pastor. She's a woman who is working in a field that, well, would get us a little bit taken back. It doesn't seem to be the churchy thing to do. She's working with prostitutes and offering hope and life to them. Pastor Paula, thank you so very much for coming and being with us. Thank you for us. having me. We, um, we read about you in the LA Times, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the story that came out of your um, your strong involvement with prostitutes. Now, you want to correct me with this. Let's get this straight out from the beginning. I'm using the word prostitute, and you want to, you want to clarify that for me. Tell me. That's correct. Uh, we have to understand that these girls are victimized, so we call them victims. Victims instead of prostitutes. That's correct. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the orientation becomes different. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your life, would you? Uh, <clears throat> why, why is this orientation toward uh, victims uh, that we might call prostitutes. Why is that happening in your life? Well, um, as a young girl, a uh, very young girl, I was uh, molested by a family member. And uh, then um, a year later, uh, there was a babysitter, a male babysitter that uh, my parents had who w molested me continually. Uh. And um, how old were you in the, when this was happening? The first one was seven. The second was nine. Wow. And and then uh, it it was almost as though there was a spirit that was on me that was discernible by these pedophiles because then when before I even turned ten, I was playing hide and seek with some neighbors and the neighbor's father. Uh, molested me. So uh, I, that sort of laid the groundwork for how my life was going to go forward because um, I always carried around that secret. I always carried around that uh, sense of uh, I wasn't uh, worth anything other than just to be used. And of course, I didn't trust. How did the how did your family react to this? Were you able to, to get Actually, a healing ear? They, my family, I did not tell them for several years. When I did finally tell my mother what had happened, um, <clears throat> she said, well, your uncle just can't come over anymore. And then that was the end of it because, you know, um, I'm not a young woman. And so in those days, you just kind of hid it. You yeah. put it under the covers, under the carpet. You but forgot it about but it. But it never left your heart and your soul, did it? No, no, it, it marred me. And so then my mother, unfortunately became alcoholic mm -hmm. and uh, there were um, a lot of turmoil in the family and so um, I even though uh, I married uh, to get away f because I didn't want to take care of the children that she was having so I married to get away uh, bad marriage uh, so when that marriage failed um, my hu ex-husband came and took my children out for an outing and I didn't see them for six months. When I was 14, I felt a call on my life to, <laughs> to be a missionary. You know, mm -hmm. all the young children want to be a missionary, but I sure. really felt this strong, strong call on my life. At 14? At 14. This is with the, the luggage of all that had happened all in the past. All that had happened. Yes. 
because my grandparents were Assembly of God ministers. In fact, they planted the church in Seal Beach. They were they they mm. put the first church in Seal Beach for Assemblies of God, and so they were constantly praying for me. And so on the summers, I always spent the summers with my grandparents and my father. And so I, I, I had that imbalance yeah, in my life. Yeah, yeah. I had an alcoholic mother that I lived with nine months out of the year, and I had this godly family I lived with three months out of the year. And so this imbalance, and I was trying to wear all these hats. So I, you know, I was ripe to have my life changed, um, uh, to fall down into the pit. Yeah. But you know, God never turns his back on us, yeah. and we turn our back on him. Yeah. But he calls out to me. He would call out to me, and I would say, "Leave me alone! I don't want anything to do with you." <laughs> I got better things to I do. I got better things to do here. I, yes. I got a score over here, yes, you yes, know. Yes, so. yes, yes. But he never, never forsakes us or leaves us. How beautiful! You decided to even go further than just having a nice spirituality, you decided to be, become a minister in the Assembly of God. Uh, that has ended up being my career at the latter years of my life because I was a healthcare consultant for many, many years. And God kept calling me and saying, you know, I've called you out to do something more than this. Kept pushing, kept, kept pushing. pushing me, kept pushing me. And I kept saying, yeah, okay, God. And when I have a bit, yeah, 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 I hear you, I hear you, I hear you. So I finally went back to, uh, to college and um, <clears throat> took my credentialing and became a, a pastor in the Assemblies of God. Excellent. Tell me a little bit. I've, I've got some questions here. Um, who are these victims uh, that we, we oftentimes call prostitutes? Who are they? They're anybody. They can be anyone's daughter. Uh, they can be anyone's son. They can come from any economic background. Um, culture has nothing to do with it. Ethnicity has nothing to do with it. However, there is a targeted area, and that's our children who are coming from underprivileged areas. Uh, our children who come from single homes, um, who uh, maybe the mother is working several jobs just to keep the family together. Or they could be what I call the fringe girl, and that could be the, the little girl who uh, like myself, has had traumatic things happen to her in her childhood, so she doesn't have a lot of self-worth. And so she is with the group, but she's always on the fringe of the group. She's the one the group maybe makes fun of or um, will just invite along because they want to look like that maybe they reach out to others. And those are the girls that, that the uh, predators look for. They look for uh, and boys, they look for for them the ones who that who feel like they don't fit in society at all. They're they're friends, and they could be rich. They could be poor. The the thing is, and I'm going to use the word prostitute, and I understand what you mean with mm -hmm. regard to victim, but we we sometimes in the media see this uh, voluptuously <laughs> beautiful woman living in a in a rich apartment, and mm -hmm. think that that's what a prostitute is. You know, mm -hmm. living that and they're making a living and making thousands and thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. That really is the exception of the case, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, it's a very, very small percentage where that takes place. <clears throat> because <clears throat> even, if, even if a young woman or a girl starts out independent, no one has uh, put her where in that position, uh, at some point some, some predator will come along and see her and snatch her up and and start guiding and directing her and taking her funds from her and uh, putting her into slave because the slaveholder, uh, what he looks for are these independents to begin with, are these young girls. And, and you're right, um, they can come from Beverly Hills or they can come from the heart of Watts. It doesn't make any difference. One of the things you said that I've, I found interesting was that the common emotion of these young girls or of even older, older women is fear. Mm -hmm. They're afraid and they're, yes. that becomes the, what allows them to get up in the morning and move through their life together. You know? Yes. Listen, let's, I, I want to come back. Um, I want to know who are these people that are enslaving them? If you can give us a picture of that. We're going to mm -hmm. take a break right now. But get a picture of that and uh, I hope in the, in the moments too we can understand 
Why was Jesus so close to prostitutes? And what, what does that have to do? I'm sure that you as a, as a minister have thought about that for a while. Stay tuned. Let, let's see what we can do to understand this very, very serious, and yet, I think with, with your hope, a solvable problem. Thank you very much for watching the program. Thank you also for sending in your donations to allow us to continue. It's so very vital. I'd like to come back to you after you've sent your donation by giving you a gift. It's a gift that is written by a friend of mine, Father Marty Padovani, a member of my community, Divine Word Missionaries. The title of the book is Healing Wounded Emotions. Father Marty is a counselor and he's going to come to you as you read this book with deep insights into some of the topics that are really at the heart of the pain and struggle that you're going with. Pain and struggle with emotions. There are some topics here that I know you'll relate to. Take, for example, anger. How do we deal with anger? Anger with other people. Anger with ourselves, even anger with God. Father Marty is going to open some doors and bring you the peace that you're looking for. What about forgiveness? Forgiveness of someone that's hurt us, or even forgiveness of ourselves. Then there's the other, the other overriding problem of emotion that we experience time and time again in our world today, and that's the problem of depression. How many, how many people have I run into that are just overwhelmed with the shadow of depression in their life and they don't know how to get out? Father Marty, with the wisdom and prayer that he gives, is going to help you in a rich way. So, as you reach out and try to help our ministry and allow us to continue, please ask for a copy of this book, Healing Wounded Emotions, by Father Marty Padovani. And together, may we bring about the peace and the power of Christ. Pastor Paula, tell us a little bit about these people that are controlling the victims. Um, how does this happen? How, how, do they, how do they get them? And then how do they maintain them? Unfortunately, uh, with our experience of slaveholders that we have um, spoken with, um, their daddy or their uncle or somebody in the family, uh, this was their profession and they're just kind of walking in their steps. Uh, or we see young boys who see the, the slaveholder out there driving the fancy car and wearing the jewelry and having mm -hmm. all the girls, and so he decides, yeah, this is what we want to be. So that's how a lot of them get into it. Um, I, I heard where one slaveholder said that he could go into a mall <clears throat> and he would uh, look for girls that were by themselves or sitting by themselves and he would sit down next to them and he would turn to them and set a, start up a conversation. If the girl looked up and looked him square in the eye and, and answered him back, he would get up and leave. But if he talked to a girl and she had her head down and she would kind of mumble her questions or her answers, he would then continue on talking to her. And he claimed that within 45 minutes he could have that girl walk out of the mall with him and get into his car. Wow. Tell me a little bit about their, their way of control. What you're saying is that these, these women are not necessarily self-confident they're Correct. struggling with a lot of things yeah. and looking for, probably looking for love and looking yes. for acceptance. Yes. And so this is where they get it and they're, whoa, they'll latch on to that as they might latch on to any kind of drug as a way of taking yes. away the pain of a family situation or a, an emotional situation. What, uh, <clears throat> there's two ways that these, these uh, victims are controlled. It's either physical or psychological. Mm. Uh, so sometimes they can't coerce a girl to leave with them, so what they will do is they will uh, <clears throat> forcibly take her, or they will go to a party, give a date rape, drug to her, 
uh, there'll be gang rapes and or they'll beat her up to control her. That's the physical part of it. Now, so she's in fear. So she's she, in she... fear of physical. Or she will see uh, a lot of times the slaveholders, if she, she misbehaves or doesn't bring home enough money, she may have to watch while he beats somebody else. Oh, and then she will know oh, that that will happen to her. Really? Now, psychologically, what they will do is, and, and the way that most of these young girls are brought into this is they uh, are convinced that the, he loves them. Uh, he, will, he will stalk them in a sense that he will follow them or he will give them a listen to their stories. Nobody listens to their stories. So he will listen to their story, be very sympathetic to them. He'll give them little gifts. One girl said that, that he gave her a little bracelet and a bottle of nail polish, and that was all it took. Whoa. And she found herself enslaved and now living in fear. Now they have fear for themselves, they have fear for their family because um, a lot of times a slaveholder will show her pictures of her, her siblings and he'll say, I'll go get them, I'll hurt them, I'll hurt your mother, I'll kill your dog because see, he's heard all of her stories so he oh. knows what is a passion in her heart. Yes, yes, yes. And so that, that's the physical way <laughs> And, and that's how they maintain it. That's how they maintain them physically through uh, physical abuse and they maintain them uh, through psychological manipulation. You, uh, hear about, you hear about drugs also as, as perhaps a way of... Right. The thing of it is that's kind of a misnomer because most of these young girls and young boys that are out there are not on drugs. They may smoke pot and that's not considered today drugs. Uh, they're not on drugs because a drug addict's very hard to control. Uh, so if a girl is, is hooked on drugs, uh, she's going to start thinking, you know, I really need a fix. There's a drug dealer down there. Why do I have to take this money back uh, to him when I can go buy the drugs myself? Control. I never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. This whole business about control, you control them, mind, body, soul, and spirit. So when we take them in and we try to help them, we address mind, body, soul, and spirit. Wow to heal them from all of this control. In this film that the uh, <clears throat> district attorney of San Bernardino County had uh, done, Teenage Sex for Sale, there's an interview of a pimp in there, and what he says is, you have to manipulate the mind. If you can't manipulate their mind, then move on. Wow. It's total mind control of these girls. Tell me a little bit about what hope does a young girl come she comes to your place. Tell us about your place. You, you've, got, you've got a center for a refuge, if you will, yes. for, for young girls to be able to come and perhaps start to see if there's a road out of this. Yes, we, have, uh, we do street ministry and we have drop-in centers and then we also have a safe house. Uh, so if a girl, when she comes into the drop-in center, or people contact her, law enforcement contacts us, and lets us know we have a girl who's interested in coming to your, your home. And we call it Rachel's House of Healing. And uh, so what I, the first year, it's, it's a 180. And um, <clears throat> what we do is we address the girl's mind, uh, help her to be, uh, to recognize that she's been manipulated. Uh, so, but we have them do Battlefield of the Mind, we have them do Boundaries, we have them do, we uh, have a book what, that, do, what do you mean, Boundaries? What, what, there's a book called Boundaries, so, see, these girls don't know what boundaries are. The only concept. boundary, the, the only concept of boundary they have is that if, if I do something that daddy, and that's what they're forced to call the controller, if I do something that daddy doesn't like, I'll be punished. Uh, Those yes. are the only boundaries they wow. know. So we teach them what boundaries there are. It, so if someone says something to you that's offensive, instead of striking out at them, you just say, you know what, I need to back away from that for a minute. So we teach them the boundary, the boundary how, to, how to have control. And what, what situations to go into and what, what, what right. to stay away from. Right. You yes. know, we, we always say that's not a fight I want to pick at this time. Yes, uh, yes. Pick and choose your fight, battles. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, we also uh, have them uh, learn about abuse. Uh, and so we have a study that, that we put them through where they understand them. Every girl that we've had in our home that's gone through this has said, I never recognized or realized that I was being sexually abused by those things that were happening to me. I didn't realize I was being controlled by those things that were happening to me. Wow. 
Tell us, a, could you give me a story or two of um, a, maybe a success of a, of a girl, of how you were able to have her come or you reached out to her and she was able to turn her life around? Well, I'll first tell you why we call our house Rachel's House. Uh, Rachel came to us many years ago, because we've been doing this eight years. Rachel came to us many years ago, and she was a very disturbed young girl, and she uh, tried to commit suicide several times. So her pimp brought her over and said, can you do something with her? I can't control her. Get out of here. The pimp is bringing her in to you. Yeah. Um, but we took her in, and we didn't know what we were doing because we hadn't been in this long enough. <clears throat> so uh, she only stayed with us about a week, and she said, you know, you guys are really nice and all that, but I can't stay. I'm going back to him because my daddy loves me. I'm going back to him. I'm missing. A um, couple of weeks later, we saw her when we went back to go talk. We turned around when we went back to go talk with her. She wasn't there. A week after that, we learned that um, a girl had been brutally raped and, and beaten, murdered, thrown in a trash can, and it was our Rachel. She was 16 years old oh. and she was pregnant. Oh. And so I said, no more Rachels. So we call our house Rachel's house so we'll remember her. So several weeks ago, this young woman, she got into a car with one of the uh, Johns and she was bleeding and her head, she had been burned with cigarettes by her slaveholder on the top of her head and she was all beaten up and she said, I can't do this anymore. I cannot do this anymore. I need help. You know, unfortunately, so many of these men who pick these girls up, all they do is they're, they're not thinking about this girl. They're not realizing the pain this girl's they're going thinking through. They're thinking about themselves and being satisfied. They're thinking about themselves, uh-huh. And so she, the longer she said this to him, he said, I, I, I've got a place for you. He said, come on. He brought her over to us at the church and he said, this girl needs help. Now this was a man who had a whole nother idea, but God had a different idea wow, in mind. Wow, how beautiful. You know, like I said earlier, what the enemy meant for evil, God used for good. He took this, this man and had him bring her to the church. Wow. So we, ha we called, we, we didn't have a place for her at our home, but we found a home for her and she's doing so well. Excellent. She's so excited. She took her clothes off. We gave her clothes to put. She took the clothes that she had on off. She threw them away and she said, I never want to see this junk again. And she put on these other clothes and she said, this is like a, a garment that has come from heaven for me. But it, it it might be a moment of grace, but it needs to have a community of support. It, Absolutely. In the long run, and that's what you're about. And also, I think that we, as members of the clergy, need to be able to say that every church should have an open door and a care to make sure that this miracle that started is able to continue. Amen? Amen. I, you know, like this, that we can continue to do this. Amen. I, um, we're going to take a, a break now and come back. We're going to be praying for some of the people. But you know what? I want to ask you a question. And I, 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 you probably have, have thought about this. Why was Jesus so, so seemingly mixed up with prostitutes? Let's get back with that. Please, stay tuned. We're, we're going to be right back. It's very important that you share in this ministry by offering your prayers and also by offering your donations to allow us to continue. We need your help. And as a sign of my, my support of you, for your support, I'd like to send you a copy of this book by a friend of mine, Father Marty Padovani, a Divine Word missionary. The title of the book is Healing Wounded Emotions. This book is going to touch such topics as how do you deal with anger? How do you deal with forgiving others? How do you deal with forgiving self? And oh my, one of the big important topics. How do we deal with depression in our life? Father Marty is going to give you a perspective of a Christian who has been able to touch the heart of a solution and true healing. Remember. Ask for the book, Healing Wounded Emotions. Pastor Paula, I'm, I'm 
really loving to hear how your, your, your interpretation of this reality of Jesus, there was a real mix with prostitutes. What was going on there? Why was Jesus so involved with prostitutes in his ministry? Um, I believe the same reason that uh, he has us become involved is that his heart broke for the ones who were the fringe. Mm. Uh, you know, the Pharisees said, uh, uh, you eat with tax collectors and you talk to, to prostitutes yes. and criminals. And he said, I didn't come to heal those that are well. I came for the sick. Yes. And, and, and you know, um, Father, he, he, he breaks our heart for what breaks his. And his heart broke for these women. That's why he went out of his way and went into Samaria to meet the woman at the well. Yeah. So, you know, it's, we have to go to them, we have to go to the well, and we have to follow him. I like the, um, our, our president, the Catholic Pope, Pope Francis, has, uh, has urged us to be evangelists, and he, he gives the little image of saying, get your shoes dirty. That's right. You know, and it's kind of like that. It's, yeah. it's a simple little image, but it does make sure that we're not just living on a on the kind of the, the nice church experience and thinking this is what it means to be a Christian. It really means being involved with those people that are hurting, especially the victims. Jesus did this as an example to us. He didn't talk about we should go do it. He went and did he it. He did it. He watched us. He, yeah. he wants us to watch him do it so we can go do it ourselves. We've got some, some people and we're, we're urging people to, to call, to write, right now, just to call it and, and to share their needs and prayers. So uh, would you pray with me? Uh, uh, you're, you're a powerful woman of God, but listen, if you would, to some of these and let's pray for them. Uh, and I'm gonna ask you, please, you, you be part of this prayer here too. Um, Christine and her sister, they're looking for salvation. Uh, Vicki, um, her sister is very sick. Would you please pray for that? Uh, Ron from Florida um, just says, would someone please help me? Sylvia from New York, uh, repair the relationship she had with her, with her daughter. Mm. And we talked about the importance of that. And Dee, Dee then from Florida, her husband has cancer. Would, would you pray? Let, yes. Let's just pray. Lord, we're, we're completely believing in your love for us and in your power and your willingness to enter into these lives, into the lives of all of those that are watching right now, with a real movement of power and strength. But Lord, I want to ask that you bless, please, Pastor Paula in her beautiful work. May she continue with good health. May a real transformation happen, and may her work be blessed. And may we, <laughs> with our prayers and our deep concern, as, as you did, Jesus, so much, Bring about a radical change into our world. And now may Jesus' love for you always make you smile.